Hello, and welcome to this final installment of the House Guest Hemingway webinar series. I am Suzanne Del Gizzo, the editor of the Hemingway Review, and also the chair of the Hemingway Society Media Committee. Today is our last uh, session in the House Guest Hemingway webinar, and we are so pleased to be featuring Hemingway, a film by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, with a discussion with Lynn Novick and her associate producer, Sarah Botstein, moderated by Alex Vernon. Uh, I'm gonna take a minute to orient you to the Zoom webinar. As an attendee, you are in view and um, listen only mode. That means that your mics are off and your cameras are off throughout the entire presentation. We can see, uh, you can see and hear us, but we can't see or hear you. If you'd like to interact with us, you should use the Q&A function in Zoom. If you drag your cursor in the computer view, it's at the bottom of your screen, but Steve Paul told me if you're using an iPad, it's actually at the top of your screen, but you will see an icon that has Q and A with two dialogue bubbles. If you click on that, you can open it and ask us questions at any time during the presentation and Alex will leave time to share your questions with Lynn and Sarah toward the end. We also want to let you know that um, this webinar is being recorded with the exception of the preview of the clip, um, but otherwise this discussion is being recorded. And since we had a bunch of emails about this, questions, we thought we would let you know these recordings are planned is to share these recordings with the Hemingway Society folks after the webinar series is over on Hemingway's birthday, which is this Tuesday, July 21st. It is a sort of birthday present to membership um, from uh, the Hemingway Society board. Okay, with that taken care of, I would like to introduce Alex Vernon. He is the I'm a Graves Peace Distinguished Professor of English at Hendricks College and a Hemingway Society board member. Alex? Thank you, Suzanne. And it's an absolute pleasure to be a part of today's webinar with my friends, Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein. Um, some of us will remember when Lynn and Sarah were on stage four years ago at our Oak Park conference, talking with Verna Kale about this project. Although at the time they were still finishing their Vietnam film and could only show us a clip from the biography of Frank Lloyd Wright to help us imagine what they might do with Hemingway. Now they are wrapping up the six hour, three part Hemingway biography, and we are very lucky to get to see a segment on A Farewell to Arms in just a moment. And I understand this is the, one of the first times they've shared it with anybody, right? So it's, it's quite an quite a, um, honor for, for us. After the segment, I'll do my best to channel everyone's curiosity through my questions for Lynn and Sarah about the film. As Suzanne mentioned, you're welcome to use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to pose your questions, some of which I'll be able to pose to the guests at the end of our, end of our conversation. And now a quick introduction of our guests. Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein both majored in American Studies, Lynn at Yale and Sarah at Barnard and Columbia. A director and producer, Lynn came to work with Ken Burns at Florentine Films in 1989. Sarah joined them as a producer in 1997. This powerhouse creative pair has joined forces on several major documentaries, Frank Lloyd Wright, Jazz, The War, Prohibition, The Vietnam War, College Behind Bars, and now Ernest Hemingway. And as, as a side note, um, watch College Behind Bars if you want um, to, to, re, to re experience the importance and value of the liberal arts experience in education. Anyway, without, without further ado, I think Lynn wants to do, say a couple of remarks about the video clip we're going to watch. And it's about nine minutes long. And when that's over, we will all come back and Lynn and Sarah and I will start to talk about their project. Lynn? Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Suzanne and Cecil and everyone else who helped get this event set up for us to be here today. Um, we've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, Sarah and I have been working with Ken Burns and Jeff Ward, the writer of our script for many, many years on this project. So we're just thrilled to be sharing it with you today. And this is the first time we have shown it publicly. So um, we're excited and a little nervous, I will say. Um, just briefly to explain what you're gonna see, we have made a six hour film. It's divided into three parts. So there's three episodes and it's organized chronologically from Hemingway's birth to death, essentially. It's gonna air on PBS in the spring of 2021, hopefully. That's, we don't have a definite date. And we're gonna drop you in to the end of the first show. Um, 
where he has already embarked on his second marriage to a woman named Pauline. For those of you who don't know, she's wife number two. And they have been living in Paris and um, they're moving to the US. And that's kind of all you need to know for what's gonna come in the, you know, chronologically in the story. But we have to give you a few caveats because this is not a finished film. Uh, this is a work in progress in the sense that we finished editing, but we have not done any of the post-production mastering. So all the material is low resolution. It looks kind of blurry a little bit and kind of hard to see sometimes. So you just have to imagine everything is gonna be beautiful and crystal clear. Um, there's sometimes time code or watermarks on the footage or the stills to prevent us from using it without permission. Uh, there's very few sound effects. The sound is really inconsistent. So, you know, what you're seeing, picture and sound, and the story we're telling is what the film is going to be, but what you're seeing is a pale imitation of what the final film will look like on TV. Um, and then because we're showing it to you on Zoom, it's jittery. So it's, it's going to sometimes feel a little stuttery, and we apologize for that. But, you know, um, I, we're, we felt it was worth take because of the timing of the conference, we really wanted to share the film as such as it is right now with all of you. And also just wanted to say a quick correction to um, Suzanne. Sarah is producer of this film. Um, she was associate producer on jazz 20 years ago, but she has been my most treasured partner. Ken Burns and I have worked with her for 20 years and she's an incredible producer and we're lucky to have her with us. Okay. Wow, thank y'all. Um, that was great. Um, I think as, as I watched that, a, a couple of things, a couple of responses I have, you know, I, I teach that text as a lot of us do. We teach it a lot. I write about it. So I've read it so many times. And I think over the course of the years of, of teaching it to, to, or sorry, reading it to teach and write, I forget how emotional it is. Right? I mean, that, that clip with the slowed down narration really reminds me of the emotional power of the novel. I've kind of forgotten as, I, as I've stuck it in my head, right, to, to, to think about it. Um, and the other thing that strikes me too as I watch that clip is how much it gets me inside Hemingway's head a little bit, right? I mean, he talks about how he's lived inside that novel and we see at the end the manuscript with the revision marks on it as well. Um, and so in, in a really compressed space, I sort of, I feel like a lot of work gets done. Um, and so I'm, I'm really impressed with, with that clip. Um, I'm wondering if you all could talk about why you chose that clip of the, of the six hours of film that you've created, <laughs> why those particular nine minutes, what is it about them that says something about the overall technique, about the story arc, thematic arc you're going for, like why? Why those nine minutes? Um, it was a hard choice, frankly, especially for this audience. Um, and we went back and forth quite a bit, but we felt that picking something that is so well known and showing how we handle it and the kind of compression that we had to do because it's you know a very complex novel with a lot more in it than what we just chose to highlight to give this group in particular a sense of how um, the film is gonna deal with the masterworks. Um, we spend more time on this one than I think almost any other work of Hemingway's. And so that's about what we can contain. And we felt, you know, trying to highlight the critical things and also see how we manage the text, who the interviews are, what they have to say. We just thought it was a good way to represent, at least in some ways, how we handle um, Hemingway at his very best, my opinion. I'm with Edna. Yeah. I, and I just, just to echo what Lynn's saying, but also address Alex, I think, for those of us who are working on the project and Lynn and I were in London together when Lynn interviewed Edna and she wanted to read that pa passage and she came with specific passages that she wanted to read to illustrate different parts of Hemingway's life and why he's such an enduring influence on her. And I think everyone in the crew cried. Now, a lot of them hadn't read A Farewell to Arms as many times as Lynn and I had, but she did change the book very much in the same way for me, actually. And every time she begins to read, you're reminded of something very special in how he wrote and in his process. And I think Lynn and I found the same thing in going to the library and seeing all the different versions, in particular that text and those passages and the ending and just what the, the craft and discipline of his artistry in that text is, is truly something and you can actually see it and feel it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that. can you talk about how that particular clip um, speaks to your techniques overall, right? And, and maybe a way of talking about that is the challenge, <laughs> right? The challenge of taking a writer and challenge of, of representing a writer and their written text in a way that, that speaks to us because we're, we're changing medium. We're going from a written text to the visual. 
Uh, that was a central challenge, I think, of making the film. And I remember four years ago when we had the conversation with Verna, Lynn and me on the plane home, saying to ourselves, how, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright is an architect, you can go into a building. Thomas Hart Benton is a painter, you can go look at his murals. These are film, you know, you can even films we didn't work on that Ken has made about monuments or objects, you can see them and film them. And reading a text is different for you than it is for me, than it is for her, than it is for editors, than it is for a 17 year old or a 40 year old, like what are, oh my God. Um, and then how to represent the fact that he did keep track of all the different versions and the editing and we composed piece of music. People do concerts where they play the opposite the different ending or a different movement than the composer published. And, you know, that's a complicated thing to do. So th this was a central challenge in making the film. And I think we don't, we don't do it the same way for every work. We don't do it the same way every time. Um, but we had a lot of fun trying to figure that out creatively. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit about the process then? I mean, you talked about how, how every project is different. Um, and so I'm curious about, about, I mean, I guess first, what's the origin story? Why did you all decide to do Hemingway? Um, and, and what was the process to get to where we are today? Well, um, Ken, Sarah, Jeff, and I have been for many, many years investigating kind of quintessentially American topics. Um, and in, I think it was about 25 years ago, I went to Key West on a vacation and went to the Hemingway house and went into the study and had kind of a, a little bit of a personal epiphany of just, oh, right, Hemingway would be a great topic for a film, in part because of his genius and influence, but also because of the very interesting life he lived. I think many writers stay home, you know, and work in their writing room. And so that's great for the work that they produce, but it wouldn't make such a great documentary. So the idea of Hemingway, this incredibly tumultuous public life and life in the public sphere and his persona and his celebrity and his fame and what he represented around the world and all of that coupled with his genius and his legacy um it seems like a great idea for something that we should tackle so that was a long time ago we had many other projects already in the works and we just kept it on the back burner for a while and um, it took us a while frankly to have the nerve to contact the family and ask them if they would be willing to work with us and um, Patrick Hemingway has been incredibly gracious. He's in the film and gave us incredible access to the archive. As you will see, they brought things out of storage that they don't normally bring out of storage and they let us have access to all the photos, the scrapbooks, the drafts, everything, the letters. That, so um, it, it, it was uh, a long time to get to this moment, but well worth all the time that we spent. So, so, so tell us about the process a little bit. I mean, is it, oh, right. is it the writer, you just send him off to spend two years writing and comes back and, and where does it go from there? Well, I think we always, we, our process is fairly um, similar for every project, but each project has its own um, specific challenges. I, for this film, you know, Jeff Ward is a writer, so he's writing about a writer. So he goes off and, reads everything, talks to everybody, kind of creates his own, I think he uses a lot of index cards, chronology, and does a draft while Lynn and I are figuring out who to interview, who our advisors should be, what archival material might make it into the film. And that's a very symbiotic thing that's happening at the same time. He's writing a narrative, we're finding interviews, where it's um, a very fluid process that takes a couple of years. And um, I think for this film, there, there's obviously the biography and the four wives and the children and all the places he lived and all the ways that he was um, understood and renowned around the world. And that's a very exciting biography. But early on, we also made the decision that we were going to interview writers from around the world who were influenced by him and try to tie those two narrative trains together. So one is his biography and the other is a constant reminder that regardless of what you think or feel about Hemingway and his actual biography and his life, he is still an influence to writers around the world this many years later and did actually remake how writers write and think 
and that that dynamic was, I think, the most challenging, exciting, rewarding, and fun part of the process, as you're saying. So we're kind of writing and shooting, and then we start editing, and our our producers find material, and we begin to sort of put the puzzle together visually. Yeah, um, and that and that part of that puzzle, I mean, it's that's a fairly straightforward clip, right, that we saw, and that it's very contained. It's, it's really about the composition of that one novel and where it fits into his life. Um, but as, as everyone on this webinar knows, he was an incredibly complicated human being. Okay. Um, I'm sort of curious if y'all could talk about your own, I don't know, moment of revelation about that complexity or, or, and or mm -hmm. how you tried to get after that complexity in the film? Big yeah. question. I would say we, we went into this sort of knowing that, like you said, but more as an abstraction or an intellectual uh, relationship. You know, this is a complicated guy and he is married a lot of times and he had struggles of mental illness and whatever. We, we knew a lot of sort of the basic facts of the biography, but probably the most revelatory moments for me anyway was seeing the letters you know, and hearing Jeff Daniels, who you heard uh, the voice of Hemingway bring them to life as well. And uh, even just the back and forth in correspondence with his wives and children. You know, this, I, I fear for future biographies, biographers of people living now, we don't write letters like that anymore. And he reveals himself in such a different voice, such a different way of being in the world, such a different way of relating to people. It's just fascinating. Um, we're so grateful to the Letters Project and to Sandy Spanier and Verna for, you know, keeping that whole process going. But that was quite revelatory. And then I think living with the images, you know, seeing him in all these different guises, posing for the camera, not being aware of the camera, in different moods. We've just become very intimately connected to the many moods of Ernest Hemingway. And the final thing I would say is just how shockingly quickly he aged. So we just, you know, when they put the pictures in order and you see how he looks in 1945 and how he looks in 1950 and how he looks in 1955 and 1960, it's shocking, truly shocking how old and ravaged he is at the end. So I think that gave us all a deeper understanding of just what his body was going through, let alone, you know, psychically what he was going through. Yeah. That's just one, you know, one way of thinking about it. And then he was endlessly photographed by the still camera, but there's very little moving footage of him and even a smaller amount of footage of him talking or hearing his voice, which is also kind of unusual for someone who was so famous and so well known and um, so comfortable in front of one type of media and very uncomfortable, I would say, from what we can tell on another media medium. And also I think, um, to your point, he's a very complicated guy, not totally likable. His his place in the world is was changing and is changing as um, you know when he's taught, what's taught, what age group of students are learning about him, what they're learning about him. So all of that was kind of changing as we were making the film too, which is a challenge and um, you know not not simple. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean. That's interesting to think about that question too, right? I mean, when you all started thinking about this a long time ago, <laughs> it's a different world now, right? I mean, we've, we've had the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and now we've had, you know, the recent events of the last four, it's a different world from last January um, too. And I wonder if you also, and it's gonna drop, who knows what's gonna happen between now and when you drop the film <laughs> too, right? We've got an election coming up. I mean, who knows where the pandemic is gonna go. Um, I wonder if y'all just sort of, you know, amongst yourselves talked about how different the film may or may not be just given the historical moment it is being it is, it is appearing in how it will be received you know yeah i mean whatever we say about the past it's as much to say about who we are in the present as it does about what actually happened yeah. what we choose and how we the choices we make about what stories to tell and how to tell them so there's no question that what's been happening in the world and our world for the last five years has affected how we've shaped the film, who we talked to, what we asked them, what we put in the film, what we didn't, what works we chose to focus on, all of it. And um, I think we were especially interested at the beginning in, you know, the new, the last 20 years of scholarship of Hemingway, maybe 25 years, reimagining him in terms of gender and masculinity and sort of his public persona versus his private 
um, impulses and concerns. And that's so fascinating. And so, you know, 20 years ago, sorry, if we'd made the film 25 years ago, I, I doubt that would have been a focus, I don't think. And it certainly is now. So, and the questions we're wrestling with about race and justice and um, who has the right to tell what story is present in the film. It's not foregrounded per se, but it's definitely present. It's part of who he is and what he embodies. There's no getting around that. And how many young female scholars are working on writing about, thinking about Hemingway? And that definitely is in the last decade and was I just for Lynn and me, two women working on the film with Ken and Jeff, very exciting and really rewarding. I think all the women that we worked with, both behind the scenes and um, on camera, really helped us understand Hemingway and make a different kind of movie than we probably would have made 20 years ago, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm struck, you know, that, that particular novel, Farewell Arms, is one in which, you know, people have famously said things like, in Hemingway, the only good woman is a dead woman. And yet here you have Edna O'Brien saying, a woman could have written that, that final passage. So I, I really appreciate mm -hmm. Edna's voice here, right, to sort of make us think mm -hmm. more largely about, about the accomplishment of that novel, too. She yeah, complicates we'll... everything about his work. Exactly. Yeah, Sorry, Lynn, I that's what I was going to say. Mm. No, I was yeah. just going to say, she has a lot to say about a deepening our understanding of him in context of other work, especially up in Michigan, which is a lesser known story, very early work that was considered too um, risque and sort of obscene to be published when he first wrote it, as many people here I'm sure know. Um, and um, she, she sort of starts this whole conversation about Hemingway, putting himself inside the head of women and thinking about what they're experiencing. That's, you know, 1920, someone here will tell me, but it's the early 20s. So that's a theme that she helps us uh, thread through the whole, whole series. So when you start something like this, I mean, the audience you were talking to now, right, are there a lot of Hemingway scholars and aficionados and, and other folks? Um, we are not necessarily the same audience that will be watching this on PBS in the spring. Um, I guess, could you talk a little bit about, about audience, right, um, considerations that you all go through when you, when you put together a film, a film like this, where you know people like me are going to be watching it. You also know a whole bunch of other kinds of people, right, for lack of better language, are going to be watching it also. I think we try to make our films for the largest possible audience and make the films interesting to every age and type of person and use the scholars like you and the intellectuals who are focused on the subjects that we're working on to be part of our process and to work with us as we make the film so that we're sure to get the subject right and not miss stuff. and if we do have the arguments behind the scenes why we are choosing to do one thing or another in any film we make, but try to stay floating up above a little bit and actually tell the story and give the facts and put the subject in context so that it's both um, hopefully entertaining and somewhat riveting, but also educational experience and you walk away learning something that you didn't know before. We felt very encouraged early on in the process when we were doing some of the interviews um, as Sarah was saying, the crew was crying when Edna was talking about Farewell to Arms, but pretty much every interview we did, our camera crew had never read much Hemingway. We had several different camera crews, but none of them had read much Hemingway. Some of them had not read any Hemingway. And at, without exception, at the end of every shoot, um, the camera person or the sound person would say to us, oh, I can't wait to go out and read, and then they would list the things that had been discussed. So I think that's, in a way, not to say that our camera crew was our target audience, but I think the way we frame the questions is, you know, to bring out for someone who knows nothing, but might just be curious. And then hopefully after they've seen the film, our goal is that they will go and read a lot of Hemingway and other writers too, because we can't possibly do justice even in six hours. You know, we can just whet your appetite basically. Right, right, yeah. Did anything I'm wondering from when you first sat down and, and, and Jeff went off, Jeff Ford went off to, to write and you all, um, you know, sort of, gave and received your marching orders at the very beginning of the process. Um, did anything change uh, given, given from your sort of initial conception of what you wanted to accomplish in the film? I know if early on you wanted to focus as much as you could on the writing, right, and, and, and not just the life, and, and certainly the clip you showed us does that, um, but did anything change about, about your sort of general approach as, as you learned more about, about, about him, about you know, what people have said and written about, about his work? Not sure. I, I think, um, 
I think the, the first draft of the script was brilliant, um, but it would say things like, and here we will discuss the sun also rises. You know, he'd like, he'd explain how the book got written and what it was about, but then we would, he'd say, and here will be the discussion. And then we had to really sit with Ken and Jeff and figure out, okay, what do we want to say about the sun also rises? What points do we want to make and what passages most importantly do you want to hear? So choosing the text, I think we started the project really not knowing. I mean, the, the, the quotes we heard in Farewell to Arms, we probably could have said those would be in the film before we started, maybe. But every other book I, or, or work, I think it was really a trial and error process to figure out what words of Hemingway written, published works, do we need to include? And um, that was really challenging. Yeah. Really, really challenging. And then what we're going to look at, like Sarah was saying. So that was kind of a blank slate at the beginning of the project. So it's not like a change. It just, it didn't really exist, sure. believe it or not. Yeah. Same, same for, you know, a movable feast or the letters, how we were going to sew the voice of Hemingway from a work mm -hmm. that is fiction to a traditional letter to a work that's memoir like some more hype that was an enormous challenge and also explaining to our editors all i think none of whom had read a lot of hemingway either like it's not hemingway he's not writing only about himself but there you have to reference some of his life and what we're cutting that was a very challenging very nuanced you know chiseling away at um at that and hopefully we've got it somewhat right we'll see <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess the larger question is, and it's probably too hard to answer, is, you know, in that chiseling process, was there kind of an overriding principle, right, that sort of helped guide the chiseling, or was it just as you went and as you were trying to get it down to your six hours, you just had to make sort of individual decisions along the way? There's, yeah, I think it's trial and error, and it's kind of what we would say, trust the process, and you just have to kind of actually watch the film as a rough draft and see if it makes sense. <laughs> as Bill uh, Ken always likes to say that, you know, he lives in New Hampshire and they make maple syrup and you start with tons and tons and tons of sap and you get down to your little quart of maple syrup. And that is um, a, the way he always describes our process. So we do start much longer and wider and we winnow it down or chisel, chisel, chisel it away. And I think, to Lynn's point, the passages were really hard. And then not only what passages do you hear, but then what passages do you actually see? And the enormous work of our producers, particularly Jonah, who was just, you know, figuring out every, she had a little database with every work and what was it typed or was it pencil or was it pen and does it <laughs> exist and can we film it? And is there a scan or not a scan? I mean, just all that stuff for you Hemingway Society people who've been there and poured over <laughs> those documents. Um, that was, in terms of how our process is similar and different, that was different. We've never made a film where we had that type of archive and had to mm. figure out what you're hearing, what you're seeing, if it doesn't match, when you are explaining to the audience what you're mm. hearing, when you don't, it, that, all of that is a, a hard, long process. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of questions in the Q&A and, and that I wanted to, at least certainly as, as you can imagine, one of the biggest questions is, who are the voices? <laughs> who, who did you get to be the voices? And I should have, we should have done a poll ahead of time to see what <laughs> people guessed. Um, several people have guessed correctly, <laughs> right? Um, at least, at least for a couple of the voices anyway. So I'm get, I'm curious if you all could do the big reveal on who you all, who, who <laughs> the voices. Well, we have Jeff Daniels reading Hemingway, both, you know, and he reads everything, both his letters, movable feast, memoir, and every work of fiction. So that was an amazing few days that we spent with him listening to him bring all read life into this material. And he, he was amazing, as you will hear. Um, Meryl Streep is Martha Gellhorn. And we were very lucky to be able to record her at all because we had planned to record her at the end of March. COVID happened, everything shut down, and we were miraculously able to get her to do a recording, basically without any of us being able to work with her. But she did, uh, it's mind blowing actually. So we're very excited about that. And then. Uh, Carrie Russell is Hadley, um, and um, Mary Louise Parker is Mary, and Patty Clarkson is Pauline. All right? Did I get that right? I you think did. I did. Yes. <laughs> we had a lot of fun recording the women. They all had a different affinity to different wives. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Any any other fun facts about about the film just to share with folks besides the voices? Mm. We haven't really 
organized our little data stacks. I think music was a big challenge. Um, thanks to um, Hillary Justice, she wrote a beautiful piece about Hemingway and music. And because people have looked at the record collections and tried to understand how music influenced him and what he listened to, popular, classical, jazz. Um, and it's a time period that Lynn and I particularly like musically, just from our work on jazz and many other subjects that tread over this period in American history. Um, so I think trying to figure out how to understand Bach's influence and listen to Bach, how to record. We worked with um, Yo-Yo Ma has a wonderful producer, violinist in his own right, who did work for us in Vietnam named Johnny Gandelsman. And he did the lion's share of the original music for the series and trying to come up with a sound for the country, a sound for the darker periods of Hemingway's life of despair and depression and mental illness, as Lynn was saying. And I do think that's another thing that has changed in terms of how our country is understanding and talking and putting Hemingway into some kind of context, not just about his alcoholism and what it's like to treat a celebrity who's having a hard time, but what kind of mental illness runs through that family um, and, and him. So music is always a challenge in any film we make, but I think was very rewarding and a lot of fun here. And when we hear popular music, where you hear classical music, where you hear the you know, influences of Spain and France and the different places he lived, and um, that's always, hopefully people will like the music. That's a little fun I, fact. The, the only other thing I would chime in is just, we had the privilege of spending some time at the Finca and the Cuban government allowed us pretty unusual access to be inside the building for multiple days with a camera crew before it opened, after it closed, day, night, evening, et cetera. And so for, you know, I think ordinary people, when you go to Cuba, you can't go inside, you can look in the window and it's an amazing place to see, but you will, if you are interested in knowing what it's really like inside that house, all that we shot for many hours and there's some really, um, beautiful material that sort of really puts you in his world. That, that is such an extraordinary um, museum to Hemingway and to his life and how he lived. So um, anyone who's interested, you will see places in the Finca that you probably hadn't been able to really see from the outside. Same yeah. with typewriters. We did a ton of homework yes. as to what kind of typewriters he used at what phase and what books were written on which kind of typewriters. And again, mm -hmm. Jonah made herself the you know second leading expert on Hemingway typewriters. And he would find them and get them restored and working ones in New York and rent them and shoot with them and kind of try to create a tableau that would look like his desk and then have photographs of him working and try to match those and put the right yeah. work and retype text. So anyway, all of that was, um, we spent a number of days shooting typewriters. Yeah. As we will. Yeah. We, we, we continue. As, yeah. We didn't yeah. shoot as actual typewriters, except yeah. for the ones that were in location. Like there's one at the Finca and there's one at um, Sun Valley. Sun Valley. But we got the exact same kind from the exact same time. So we could play around with it. Yeah. 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 That's great. As we go on, I'm starting to work in some of the questions that people have been sending as well. Right. Okay. Great. Um, and one interesting question is as, as, as filmmakers, as you read his texts, did any of them feel particularly cinematic or, or felt like they would lend themselves to cinema mm. better? I mean, given, given what he was, I mean, he, he was writing when cinema is hitting the scene, right? So in some ways he's responding to cinema. I wonder if y'all noticed any kind of more cinematic sensibility in it. That's such a good question. <laughs> it is. Wow. I mean, can, his powers of description are so incredible. That's, yeah. you know, it, it's astonishing how, much you can conjure in your head what he's describing. Certainly the sun also rises, you know, reading that book for the first time, you just, you, you, you see that world. And for a lot of us, it wasn't the world I knew anything about. So I know there've been lots of movies that have tried to be, have some not very good movies have been made of mostly of Hemingway's work, I think. So it, it poses a lot of challenges probably for our conventions of movie making, but his visual powers of visual description are astonishing and his understatement, mm -hmm. you know, um, is also very cinematic, I would say. So he doesn't have to tell you what the person's thinking. And if it was a movie, you'd see their expression on their face, you know, and maybe someone wouldn't say much, but you'd feel what they're feeling. And he manages to do that with words on a page. Right. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm, I'm thinking too, I mean, this doesn't really answer that question, but in the clip we saw um, the scene in the hospital room, mm. right? I mean, you, you left an empty room as opposed to, so that we can kind of fill in our, with our imaginations, right? What we're sort of seeing in that moment, right? It, it sort of felt, I, I kind of like that respect for your audience's imagination, even as you give us a sense of what that would have looked like mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, and to go back to the last question, Peter Coyote is the narrator, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, um, people are also asking about the, the writing, the writers who are talking heads in the film. How did you select those folks who, who have we not seen yet that we can look forward to seeing in the, in the final film? Well, how much are we going to give away, Lynn? <laughs> no. It's, it's okay. I think we can tell who's in the film. I don't know. Yeah, you well, you saw Tobias Wolf and Edna O'Brien, Abraham Verghese, it's an incredible interview through the whole film. Um, Mario, I'm gonna butcher his name, Mario Vargas Llosa, incredible interview, very, he and Edna don't always agree on what they think. That's the most fun, actually, I would say, is when the writers argue over whether a work is good or not and why. Mm -hmm. um, who else did we interview? Those are the main well-known. Tim O'Brien. Tim O'Brien, right. Yeah, we have so many number of Hemingway scholars as well, but in terms of writers of fiction, I think that covers it, yeah. And you know, it was kind of um, a little bit hit or miss. Partly it was reading writers and imagining, oh, this person must have been influenced by, I mean, everyone's influenced by Hemingway, but something particular would say, you know, they might have something specifically to say. And some writers, we didn't know whether they liked Hemingway or were interested in Hemingway or not. And so it was kind of just asking, we're doing this film, your work is very powerful, would you be willing to speak about Hemingway? And Edna O'Brien um, in particular um, was just, jumped at the chance because Hemingway had a huge influence on her when she was first just starting out and she's talked about that. And same with Abraham Verghese and Tim O'Brien as you well know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but it was, it was, it wasn't like you can go look up which writers today would like to talk about Hemingway. It was really hit or miss. Yeah. Um, other folks are asking, um, were there moments in his life, periods in his life where you felt like um, it was a challenge to, to come up with, with visuals or information, like were there sort of holes, places in his life that you, that you wished Gosh, if we had only had X, right, where you, where you sort of had that kind of challenge of, of almost a, a dearth, either visually or, or some other kind of dearth. Does that I make don't sense? Know if there's, I mean, well documented, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so much is really well documented and he's so well photographed. I think I would go, answer that question going back to the challenge of what to show when you're hearing a work. Yeah. Particularly, I think for the short stories, the descriptions of nature, and again, not wanting to be too illustrative, but you know, some of my favorite scenes are you're just on a low drone going over water hearing his words so that you're not over-focused on what you're looking at, but you're in a place of nature that he also loved and revered and wrote about in different ways. Uh, I think that's more, more, more for this film was less, you know, like Lynn and I made a film on World War II and we, you know, would, there's whole scenes where there's no archival material for what we're describing and how are we gonna, fit. that didn't happen here, but it was more, how are you gonna project into somebody else's brain what you're hearing, what he wrote? Yeah. You, you mentioned the Finca and, and the fact that you got to film there. What other, what other actual sites were you, did you film live at? Did you go film a bullfight? I mean, what, what else sort of did you all film versus relying on archival footage for? Well, it kind of speaks to what Sarah was saying that his life is so well documented and the places he was and the things he did are so well documented, not just him, but there's a lot of footage of bullfights. There's a lot of footage of Paris in the twenties. There's a lot of footage of World War II or World War I. So it turns out that following him around history, he tended to be in places where there were cameras, I would say. So um, it, it wasn't really a, as much of a challenge as it has been in other projects. Yeah, surprisingly. Um, but we did film in Ketchum um, the house there and we did not end up filming in Key West and otherwise we didn't really do a lot of live cinematography we, we ordinarily do but the typewriters was really our yeah we did know, for, for his biography we did typewriters we did a lot of live cinematography trout streams 
of water, of different, a dock for up in Michigan. I mean, we did that sort of thing, but not um, places where Hemingway actually walked or stepped or fished. Yeah, so, so people- I, We did think about it. I mean, just, we did, we talked about maybe filming in Upper Mich in Michigan um, or in Oak Park, but again, they're so well documented that we didn't really need to go to the actual place. And the photographs are great. So it's really fun to see those places archivally at the time that he was maybe seeing them or right. living there or being there. Yeah, I mean, a couple of people are asking in particular about, about bullfighting and safaris and, and how, how you all visually capture those kinds of <laughs> moments in his life, right? Well, he captured great. them. I mean, that's yeah. the thing, right? So, yeah. <laughs> they had There's great camera. material of the safaris, great material of the bullfight, great footage of Spain, incredible footage of Africa. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we did supplement with footage that wasn't from his actual safari, but, or safaris rather. So, but yeah, we started with what they had, which is amazing. So, so some, and, and bullfighting, wow. Who knew there was incredible archive of photos of bullfighting, footage of bullfighting all through the 20th century, so. Yeah, some yeah. people are asking about some of the, some of the um, less positive aspects of his character, right? I mean, his, his moments of cruelty um, his moments of what we would say today of, of, of political incorrectness, right? I mean, again, given our current moment of Black Lives Matter, um, how did how did you all tackle some of those some of those less savory aspects of his of his personality? Hopefully, really honestly, yeah. you know, as someone says, they're not going to let him off the hook. You know, we're making a film about him because he's a great artist, and an important person and has an enormous amount of baggage too. And so, you know, um, we, don't, we don't let him off the hook and we don't sugarcoat or make excuses, but we do try to contextualize so that he is very much in his time and of his time. Mm -hmm. But that again, doesn't let him off the hook because not everyone at his time acted or spoke or behaved the way that he did around, especially around race, mm -hmm. but anti-Semitism for sure and um, his relationships with women. I mean, all of this is a very complicated person. And, um, you know, it, 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 in his art, he wrestles with some of these things and not with others. So we hope we let the audience kind of take all this in. Um, it's not hagiography hey, by any means. Yeah. And thank you for the question. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Um... We, we have a lot of our, I mean, the lovely thing about a webinar is we have people from all over the world, right? Wow. Um, so we have several people from, from Europe asking, how are they gonna be, if, if this is gonna be on PBS, is it gonna be on Netflix, some other streaming service? What, what are the plans so that people outside the, the continent of the United States can, can watch it? So we go through this on every film that we make and every film is different. Hopefully, um, some of the larger countries uh, around the world that are interested in Hemingway or have um, channels and networks and uh, they will license the film in France and England and uh, different places like that. And then our films always go up on various streaming services and each film is different. So Amazon, Netflix, PBS has its own streaming service in certain parts of the world. So it's always after our initial broadcast. And then the film is also available on iTunes and you can buy it and there will be DVDs the old fashioned way. Um, but it's a little soon for us to know exactly where, where it will roll out in the world and when, but it will be all kind of summer and fall of 2021, hopefully. Yeah. I know sometimes it's, a lot it's of, not all six hours. Yeah. Right. I know with they a lot of your old cut films, it down for it. A lot of your old films, Jeff Ward turns them into a book also. Is, is that in the works for this one as well or? Other, no, okay. No companion book. No companion book. Okay. So many books about Hemingway already. We only really do a book when we feel there isn't a book of a particular topic that someone could go and read. And there's, goodness knows, so many books already, so. Right, right. Um, I mean, we're, we're starting to wind down on time. I guess a couple of final questions. One is, um, can you all just relate a particular moment of, of joy or fun in coming up with this with this great film, or maybe even maybe even give us some teasers. We only saw nine minutes. Like, what what else is there, sort of, you know, to look forward to? And maybe especially for the Hemingway scholar folks who 
most of us think we know <laughs> the subject pretty well. Um, yeah. I think we, we dive into hopefully every major work. You guys will all um, come to us with the favorite short story that we left out or we didn't address some aspect of a novel, but I think we do touch on most every work. And, um, I, you know, it's, um, and we're not, as Lynn said, we don't sugarcoat or hide from the more difficult aspects of his life and the writing that isn't as good and why and poke fun of him, at him a little, little bit for, um, or at least let the scholars poke fun of, at him a little bit. Um, in the places where he's not as um, clearly at the top of his game. I think, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's uh, gonna be rewarding for those of you who know a lot about him and can learn or see or hear things a little bit differently than you have all these years. No big yeah. spoiler alerts, I don't think. No, definitely not, no, I agree. I completely agree. I think the revelation, if there was one, aside from just the, the pleasure and privilege of putting this all, you know, swimming through Hemingway's life and work for all this time was listening to Jeff Daniels read because, you know, we've read every work. We actually had a wonderful actor read temp for us so that we could have material to work with. Um, and we've been listening to that and he was terrific. But listening to Jeff Daniels read, especially the fiction, um, I got chills. I sometimes got in tears. I mean, it's just the power of the words. Forget about, we're not looking at a movie. We're just listening to the words with it. You know, we're focusing very intently on the reading to make sure that, you know, we have different options and different interpretations. We don't really know what he's going to do, but there were moments in that reading that I really, even today, I get choked up thinking about it because he sort of was able to bring some deep humanity and sensitivity to the words and to help us understand Hemingway's genius in a way that I really hadn't. And I've listened to Hemingway's books on tape and they're great, but it's, it's not the same. An actor of his um, sensitivity and humanity um, and particularly some of the dialogue. You know, when you're reading dialogue on a page, sometimes, I don't know, I don't necessarily go back and forth in my head between the characters the way that I think he meant us to. And yeah. Jeff was able to do that. So some of these very important conversations of people that are having problems and aren't talking about it or not really directly talking about it. That's classic Hemingway. Those like White Elephants, Macumber, Kilimanjaro, these like seminal works where it's about relationships. What he did with those texts, I, I, I don't think we'll ever be able to thank him enough. That, yeah, it. and I, I think the only other thing I would say is that it hadn't occurred to me to listening to Lynn just now that no matter how you feel about Hemingway, at the end when he dies, it's it's tragic and it's sad and the reporting around his death and the influence at the t in real time as he was dying is um is very moving in the film our editors did a beautiful job and it's very sad yeah it's insane. yeah yeah i mean we're, we're sort of up we're up against the end of our time and so i sort of hate to end on sadness <laughs> <laughs> um well, can you all can, can, can do you all feel at liberty to say what your next project is as you roll off this one you can, you can do yeah. this. Yeah, well. we have several. We have several projects. Um, we're working with Ken on a three-part series on America's response to the Holocaust. So we're going to go back over the 1930s and World War II again, but from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be really interesting, sort of a refugee and immigration crisis yeah. and how we handled it or didn't. And then I'm doing a series on the history of crime and punishment in America. And we're together working on a series on LBJ's presidency. And That's I'm helping, um, Ken is producing a big uh, series on the American Revolution. So I am working mm -hmm. on that. Great. Well, I think Suzanne has a couple of closing comments to make, but what I would offer, first of all, just thank you both. Um, and from, from you know, as, as we were talking, I'm also paying attention to people's comments and I can't even, ex it's hard to express how excited people are. Yes. They're so looking forward to this. There's so many questions that they asked we could not get to. <laughs> um, but really what I, what I take from their comments is just enthusiasm and, you know, wish it would come out sooner than, than <laughs> 2021 so that everybody can watch it. So thank well, you. Well, so I, I will just say we'd love to get feedback. So when the film comes out, please don't hesitate to let us know what you think, good or bad. We'd love to hear, especially from this incredible group. Great, thank you all. Suzanne? 
Yeah, great. And thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Sarah. So sorry about the producer. I don't know where that came from. It wasn't something I saw. Anyway, totally thank you. Okay. And thank you so much, Alex. Well, we did get bombarded with questions there, didn't we? So you did a heroic job uh, working through those. I tried to help where I could. In any event, thank you again. And now I just want to say this is the end of our three-day extravaganza of House Guest Hemingway webinar series, except for those of you who are Hemingway Society members, you are invited to a membership meeting that will begin at 5.30. In that meeting, we're going to preview uh, two proposals for our 2022, I'm trying to know when that conference is going to happen, 2022 conference. So please join us for that. And in case you're dying to get to that meeting, but you're not a member yet, you have exactly 25 minutes to do that. And you can join the society by going to www.hemingwaysociety.org. Again, Lynn, Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Thanks to the audience for your time. And we will see you next year, we hope, in Wyoming and Montana and see some of you in the membership meeting soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.